Thank you very much. You've heard my name. I uh, work, run a small company called Skling. Uh, we do data processing as a service. We call it data factory as a service because we do this in what we call industrialized manner. I will explain that later. Um, there is a myth in IT in general and in, uh, in perhaps in data in particular that uh, all of companies are doing quite okay in most things. And uh, I mean, there are some leaders out there, but we're just right behind them. If we just have some, some big data or some AI or some LLMs, we'll be just like them and, and uh, we'll be able to catch up quickly. Uh, that's not what I've seen. Uh, what I've seen is that the capabilities in various different dimensions more look like this, that most uh, companies are in the same order of capability, and then there are a few leaders, a small elite, that are way ahead of everybody else. Not in every aspect. Uh, I have had the opportunity to work for a couple of these leaders. I worked for Google about 15 years ago, and then for, for Spotify about 10 years ago. And uh, those are really leading in some areas, but then they are not so great in some other areas, I noticed when I've been at a couple of these. Uh, so, we, nothing to be ashamed of, we all suck at most things, but we can see this as an opportunity if we can move there. there there's plenty of, of uh, value to, to be had. This shouldn't be a surprise because uh, now some five, six years ago, there was a bunch of research being done at, in, in the DevOps field uh, about uh, the KPIs and capabilities of productivity. And they found the same if they measure things, uh, that most companies are behind. And then there is a small elite, which is like uh, two, three orders of magnitude uh, faster than the other in terms of, of uh, ability to deploy things, change things, the stability and so forth. Uh, I've observed the same in data engineering. We don't have the same type of research, but I've uh, Ask, probe people, ask people over the years uh, for concrete numbers, and I've seen the same. We can measure uh, our KPIs in a similar way, like the lead time from we think about something until we have a pipeline in production, how fast we are in changing pipelines, and uh, the cost of operations and so forth. Uh, if we look at the cost of operations, uh, one sort of proxy metric is how many data sets we are able to produce per, per software engineer. And if, uh, I, when I've asked like uh, telecom companies, banks, uh, uh, insurance companies and so forth, I get the answer that you know, the, these uh, data analytics departments or, or business insights departments, they have you know, one order of 50-ish uh, people and they produce a few hundred data sets per day. If we look at the leaders here, uh, at, I was at Spotify about 2014 when we decided to do a democratization of, of data within the company. Uh, and then the usage is exploded thereafter. So they are producing on the order of thousands of data sets uh, per day. Google is another few orders of magnitude way beyond that. This matters because if we manage to push the speed up and the cost down, we can create amazing things. And the best example I had is uh, Spotify's feature Discover Weekly, which, which was launched a, uh, 18 months after we did this democratization of the data platform within the company. Uh, and I was very uh, humbled and proud because the people that said, that created this said, uh, this was, we could do this because the company had enabled bottom-up innovation. It wasn't a strategic decision at the sea level and 50 engineers. We were three engineers, we realized something, we built this thing in three weeks and then we launched it. The CEO didn't even approve, he didn't like it. And one year later they had uh, 40 million active users, which is probably the most popular machine learning feature ever built in, in Europe. In contrast, I've been, I've been working with some enterprises, and these are examples of things that I've heard. I heard recently one of our, our most uh, prominent Swedish companies say, we built this internal data tool, but in order to do that, we had to fill in an application and get an approval from, from the headquarters, right? Uh, another company that I visited, they need two committed decisions to do anything before you could write code, right? So uh, while, while the Discover Weekly was out there generating millions of users, these companies were still you know, fiddling with applications. And some of them even say with pride that we're still doing waterfall. You'd think you know, we have done this for a number of decades, but no, it's, it's still out there for, I guess, for a number of decades more. 
Do you see the span? The, the, the width, the, the difference in capabilities here, right? The, the many orders of magnitude. I learned after, after working at Google and Spotify, they can do amazing things with data. So I've given it, taken it as my, uh, my personal mission to sort of spread these capabilities uh, when I sort of left these, uh, the technical elite companies. And I, for a while I worked at, uh, I helped two companies build data platforms. Uh, and this was these giant, enormous efforts that took hundreds of millions of, of crowns and, and took like years before they produced anything. And I figured there ha has to be a different way. Uh, so we now have a model which is super lightweight, where we do the absolute necessary and, and shy away from, from all the complexity that, it, that we can avoid. And it has worked beautifully, technically. Uh, so we are still, for example, if you look at these lines, we are, these lines, we are uh, producing a similar amount of data sets per day per user as Spotify does, but with a minimal amount of, of, of investment. Sometimes we're constrained by uh, the clients because it's really difficult to help these enterprise uh, companies. You have to fit in. A, and even though you can work with technology, it's difficult to, uh, to sort of translate that into improved business for them. So, we have a simple marketing strategy. We try to share the things uh, that uh, we found valuable and how we work, and that's why I'm here today. Um, uh, the topic of the day is data agility, yet another of these KPI metrics that, that, where there's a huge difference. I made this highly unscientific poll a few years ago. and said, how, how fast can you change your pipelines? Like from, from, you change something in the beginning, when is the, when is the change done in all of the downstream pipelines at the end? And you see the answers here, the median answer is six months. The uh, fastest answer is less than a day. And you see the orders of magnitude and difference again. And also a few leaders, many laggers. How to get there, there are two parts. There are the culture, there, there's a culture part. Uh, if you have to ask for committees for approvals, there's nothing that I can do to help you, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but then the, if you get past that, there's a technical part, and that's what I'm, I'm here to speak about today. I realized on my way here that uh, I need to sort of talk a bit about how we work, use workflow orchestration, because it's a, key, it's a key component here in the agility. And I listened to a podcast from, from Dagster, one of the tools, and they said, oh yeah, we... Uh, we, when you want to rerun a pipeline because the in, incoming data has changed, I was like, wait, wait a minute, you do that? I, I had no idea. And I heard similar uh, scenarios from, from Jarek here, here earlier this morning. And so I'd like to uh, explain that we do some things differently than what, what uh, you might have, have seen out there uh, and why. Um, workflow orchestration, there are a... a, a uh, number of sort of fundamentals here. There are, there are data things, the, the, the artifacts, the data, create, data sets, tables, and so forth that we build, and we have predicates to build them, and, and sensors where we sense that something has happened, so we should now do things, and then there are dependencies between them, and these uh, form a DAG. The DAG is sort of parameterized uh, per day, per time, or per something else, or whatever. Uh, the names here is what we use in Luigi. We still use Luigi, which we, was built at Spotify before I came there, now almost 15 years ago. Um, it is super simple, and that's one of the reasons why, why we still use it. It is also not preventing us from doing things, which is why we never switched to one of the, the later, more prettier, uh, and well-packaged and more easily understandable uh, workflow managers. Um, we work with workflow and all of, of the data exclusively as code. We, uh, part of the agility is to cut out all of the manual operations. No babysitting, no manual triggers of pipelines, no rerunning because the data has changed and so forth. And we keep it... We are, a very strong, uh, strongly believe in the philosophy that we should never work with the data. We should work with the process that builds the data. So it's the difference between craft and industry.
This goes back a, a long time. Uh, this is one of the things that were really successful in the, the work that we did at Spotify in, in order to democratize uh, data. We enabled continuous deployment. So whenever something is, uh, whenever there's a pull request, it is tested, it's merged to master, it passes all the tests, it automatically goes out to, uh, to production. How many people use continuous deployment of the pipelines here today? Oh. Good, it has spread. This was unheard of at the time. Probably somebody did it before us, but this was completely uncharted territory. So we had to invent things. Uh, we, we packaged everything in, in the poor man's container, a tarball, uh, and uh, the reason was that Docker was not, it was available, but it wasn't stable enough to actually be used. Um, so, and this is one of the things we did right, was to sort of keep everything in very small components so when Docker became available and usable, we could take out those few hundred lines that unpack the tarball, put in Docker there instead. And later we could, or the people that came after me could remove that uh, structure and, and uh, move to Kubernetes with very small changes. This is, might be obvious, but this is typically much more difficult if you have an enterprise one-stop shop solution for, for all of your orchestration and your pipelines. This is uh, what it looked like, or probably, mostly does uh, at Spotify. We've, since uh, leaving for the sort of web scale uh, arena for smaller environments, we've, uh, this, uh, we've concluded that we don't need the, cluster, the compute clusters anymore. We used to have parallelism at multiple levels, at workflow level, at sort of cluster compute level, and then at thread level. If we can cut out the middle one and just use workflow and threads, we can save a lot of, of operational overhead. So this is what we've been uh, doing ever since just using Kubernetes for, for the scaling. So we could deploy things, but in order to deploy things, we, uh, you need to sort of test, be able to test them uh, as well. And there are a number of ways, of, of different ways that you can uh, test your pipeline jobs. Uh, we've chosen a couple of them, mainly the single job level, but not any smaller, so we uh, typically avoid unit tests. Uh, and then we, do at, uh, we test at the end-to-end -end pipeline uh, level as well. Testing single jobs is fairly straightforward. You generate some data, you run a job on that data, you look at what it produced, and, uh, uh, and then you uh, pass or fail. Uh, the uh, one trap here is that you do not want to uh, actually uh, materialize the data on disk uh, so that you test the uh, the serialization routines, because it, a lot of bugs tend to hide in there. Uh, this is what we use to cover most of the business logic, because this is fine-grained enough so that you can test all of the uh, nitty-gritty logic. But then what we saw, oops, that wasn't, not a good move. Um, what we saw was that even though you could test things, people were nevertheless afraid of breaking things downstream. I discovered at some point that we had this enormous flora of time formats. And when I asked people, why are you using this like, completely crazy format? Yeah, I know, somebody made a mistake, but you know, we don't dare to change anything because we don't know what will break downstream. And a lot of com companies are paralyzed by this. We don't dare to do things because uh, it might break downstream. We tried to pull something off at Spotify uh, to do this, but we were uh, prevented essentially by the autonomous culture because it's really difficult to coordinate across many teams uh, in, in that kind of culture. So we never succeeded, but we've done this afterwards. Uh, there are a couple of different ways that you can do this. You can either create some kind of custom multi-job that you test in the same type of harness as the previous one, or the path that we chose is to include workflow management and workflow orchestration in the testing and create this sort of a workflow manager set up for test. Problem is that none of the workflow orchestrators are really made for this. Uh, I know Dagster has some support, uh, but I haven't uh, dug too much deep into it. So uh, we invented something that uh, we, in reference to Luigi, called the, the warp zone, where you take your workflow DAG and you rewrite it 
so that it doesn't no longer refer to the, to the uh, URIs that, uh, that point out uh, cloud data buckets and um, production databases and so forth, but we rewrite it to, to refer to local disk and, and your MySQL that runs on your local machine and so forth, th so that we can test things uh, locally, which is a prerequisite for running it in, in, in continuous integration and continuous deployment. And we package this rewriting code as part of the production container. So it's actually in there in production, but it isn't enabled until a magic environment variable kicks in. So how do, does this rewriting happen? The, uh, if you would ask a, a, a software engineer with Java Enterprise background, you, you would get answers like, yeah, you have a layer of indirection, a data access layer, and then you do some... some uh, dependency injection and so on and so forth. Uh, this it has, comes with some disadvantages in data environments because a whole bunch of jobs might be written by data scientists who don't want this increased level of complexities and so forth. Not very often you come in after the fact and try to test things and you, then there's a friction on the introducing these kinds of layers. Um, so we tried something weird. Uh, which you can either call aspect-oriented testing if you want to be nice, you can also call it terrible, hideous monkey patching that scares children. But what we did was to uh, leverage that Python is, is very dynamic, and we have this rule set of rules that go into the DAG as it is being built, and it's sometimes being built dynamically, so it needs to be in there and sort of hook everywhere and change the targets and change, in some case, the, the tasks. Uh, so that they refer to your local disk in, instead here, instead of uh, S3, for example, or at the top. Uh, if you, some of our jobs look at timestamps of the object, so we need taught them to look at the timestamps on local disk instead. Uh, and this worked in a sense that we were able to pull it off, but it comes at, at a certain uh, complexity cost. And we don't like complex things, but the complexity here is all in the test environment. There's no complexity in the in production code, and, th and that's kind of what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to keep the workflow orchestration simple. Now, it has we've been doing this for a number of years, and it has enabled end-to-end -end pipeline testing. Uh, but but the now, nowadays, the sort of the complexity cost has started to bite us because we want to build higher and higher abstractions on, on workflow orchestration so that you don't deal with jobs and pipelines, but families of pipelines that, that are similar and, and so forth. Uh, but it has, a, ha, has had a number of, of advantages and, as well, and this one is something that we use fairly often. You can reach into third-party components that don't provide a seam and uh, add a seam in there, which, uh, which has helped a lot. So, uh, w one other thing with the, these pipe tests that we call them is that they're slow because they tend to run a whole series of Spark jobs. And if you have these aggregations or fan outs where you build up a month worth of, uh, or a monthly report of data based on things that come in each hour, the DAG can be pretty big. And if you want to start Spark f for each one of them, things take a very long time. At some point, we discovered a bug in a basic function in Spark, and it turns out it really wasn't tested. Uh, so then the, the uh, argument for using Spark because it's the battle-tested thing sort of seemed not so valid anymore. So we did some experiments and say, okay, what if we just ditch the whole framework and, and just use Scala collections, basically? Uh, that turned out to be much more performant in the scenarios that we care about. Since we're not doing web scale anymore because we have customers that, are, that don't have huge amounts of data. So we care more about fast iterations on smallish amounts of data. We don't need a scaling. And it turns out that, uh, that the, uh, if you just use plain Scala, it performs an order of magnitude better on all of the several of these metrics that we actually care about. Um, so that was, that was quite surprising to us, and I wish I'd, we'd done this, this move earlier. This mattered a lot for the ability to create new things and test them out quickly. So, uh, jumping off to 
sort of workflow models and process models. This is from uh, the pandemic. The Swedish health authorities would show this kind of graph every day. So if you just looked at the graph, you'd think that, ooh, pandemic is over, yahoo, except that it wasn't. It, it, it lasted for another couple of years. And uh, you understand what's going on here. Uh, probably this is the collection delay. So we don't have so many uh, data points out there because they're still, the data is still on the way in. Some uh, nice people on the internet provided that you can't show these graphs. They're just misleading. Now, in the case of, of, uh, of a pandemic, we understand this was so simple. We understand what's going on. But if it was like a machine learning evaluation thingy, we might be completely fooled. Um, so uh, this is an example of what you can do instead. You decide how long, you how long for how long you collect, and then you compare similar apples with apples and not apples with oranges, and you get these uh, fairly flat uh, with some noise uh, so, so that you can actually see whether tr the trend is going up or down. Now, the problem is that most people work in paradigms where that downward slope is the natural thing that happens. If you're doing stream processing, for example, you, the stream goes in and updates a, a table, and uh, there will be delays. So it always puts down at the end. Likewise, if, you, if you're doing uh, data warehousing, uh, where you update the table, continuously update the table uh, all the time. And this is what naturally will happen unless you put in mitigations. This is a significant difference from, from the sort of the ways of working that were introduced in, in the big data hype and when, when the data lakes uh, appeared. Because they combine with workflow orchestration, give you the capability to address data, slice data the way that you need at, so that you can say, at this given point in time, what, was the, what did we know about X? And uh, if in this case, if you, if you instead of partitioning on the event date, partitioning on the collection date, you will not be fooled. But then in order to look at the events, you will need to reorder things so that you can look at the uh, look at what happened during a, partition, a particular day, how many people died, for example. Uh, and the way that we do that is, uh, this is an example, there are many ways to do this, but this is a very simple example. You just decide how long you will wait, and then you reshuffle, and filter out the things that you care about. And if you're wonder, wondering, did we wait enough, then you can add a little counter to see how, how many uh, underspills or overspills that we have. And then, you can say, for your use case, how, how much time do I want to spend waiting to increase the completeness or increase the quality here? And this is what we do instead of rerunning the graphs when things have changed or when new data has arrived and so forth. Because if you, rerun, if you decide to rerun a graph uh, at certain conditions, you decide for everybody downstream that this is the decision that you want to make. But this is always use case dependent. If you, if you want fast data, you can have that, but you can't both have, have fast and accurate data. So uh, we use the immutability concepts as well to sort of uh, cut down our operation costs when, when things go wrong. So uh, the only time, Back in the days, uh, uh, we, the only time that we used to change data was to delete data when, when things actually went wrong, uh, which is the case if we had a bug or something like that. And then if we store all the versions of, of the output data sets, we could back to them and then recover, recover and move on and so forth. Um, nowadays, we've changed the model slightly. So we have a model that we call the frozen lake, where we don't delete any data anymore. Instead of reversion these data sets, we reversion the jobs that generate them, we reversion the data sets, so that uh, when something goes wrong, we just bump the version instead. But the old version is still there, so if anyone downstream is satisfied with the old version, they can still use it. And uh, we can decide whether to stop producing the old version or to produce multiple versions in parallel, and that's also a okay use case dependent, so uh, sometimes we, we just stop and uh, everybody has to wait downstream, or, and sometimes we, we keep them in parallel. And I'm saying that 
downstream can decide. This is an example of a workflow code where you can decide that uh, there is a previous version uh, out there and we are going to use the previous version unless the new version exists. So this is an example of one use case deciding. Uh, and this is decided in the consumer so that the p people who write this code don't need to s so sort of uh, synchronize with the upstream on when reprodu reprocessing happens. There's a variant of that uh, where uh, we would use dynamic uh, sort of decisions on what workflow to use uh, or what data set to use depending on data availability instead of, uh, of code versioning and so forth. And you see how little code there is for implementing these sort of advanced workflow patterns, right? This is why uh, we still uh, use old Luigi. I, I'm not recommending that you use it because it's, uh, it's old and clunky. But all of the later tools have been much more opinionated and have sort of prevent us from doing these things. And these things are important to us. So, how am I doing? Um, schema management. Uh, we, one thing that came with the sort of the, uh, the transitioning from data warehousing to data lakes was that data warehouses are built on schema on write, where there is a, a technical convention that, that you, you must apply with this or you must comply with the schema in order to write things to the storage, otherwise things will fail. Uh, whereas uh, Scheme on Read became popular where you can write anything to the storage, but then on reading, uh, it, the sort of the schema is assumed that it can be different for different readers and so forth. The, uh, the choice between Scheme on Read and Scheme on Write depends on uh, whether you want things to be strictly checked in order to be stable or whether you want fast agility when you add things. So this is, I think this slide is about 10 years old or something, uh, where we used to come from the sort of the scheme on right uh, uh, usage uh, due to where data warehousing traditions and also due to using Hadoop MapReduce, which is very much scheme on right. Uh, but there was a need to be able to introduce new uh, fields, for example, in, in, in the collection phase and quickly see those out on, uh, on to do products and sites and so forth. So Schema Write became popular for, for uh, some applications. We've tried to do some work to get the best of both worlds here. And um, we've used uh, Scala metaprogramming uh, as a tool here. So you can, you, can def you can need to decide how you define your schemas. And we've chosen to use uh, case, Scala case classes as the schemas. Uh, it doesn't matter so much, but the, this is the choice that we made. Uh, and then from the case classes, we derive a whole bunch of different things so that we cut down the boilerplate and the need to keep things synchronized across the, uh, across the data platform. I'm going to uh, name a few, uh, look into a few of those. Um, uh, but the tool that we used to do so is called Scala Meta and it provides you with a programmatic interface to the Scala source code. So for a schema, example of a schema here, where we've added some uh, custom annotations that we use, you sort of get a tree. Uh, this is not actually code, but, but sort of a dump of the tree that you can traverse and your, your annotations are uh, preserved so you can act on them. Scala Meta is, is used for a number of the different things. Uh, one of the more popular is Scala Fix, uh, which is a way to sort of analyze and transform source code. This is a, uh, what I think a cool example. Uh, this is from uh, Shio, as a data processing framework from Spotify. They're upgrade routines, and this is a transformational source code that you apply when upgrading from 07 to 08. Uh, so that you can sort of mechanically do the upgrade. And I think this is a glimpse in sort of future of software engineering here. What we use it for is offline code generation. So uh, off, by offline, I mean uh, not during compile time, uh, but during build time when the, uh, as part of the build system. One example is, is test equality. In many of our tests, we, uh, we have, OK, this record should be the same as, as that record. And there, that works fine in plain Scala, except that if you have floating types in there, uh, you will get these spurious errors. So we teach 
uh, with help of the code generation, we teach the test code to not care about the last few decimals in, in, uh, in floats. Another example is that we have some Python code, uh, the workflow orchestration, which manages the, the uh, egress uh, SQL tables is in Python, so we need to propagate the schemas there. We used to manage them manually, and nowadays we generate uh, from, the av from the schemas, we generate Avro definitions. Those are dynamically picked up by Python, uh, and the egress tables are generated from there. And if we want to override something, we use our, our custom annotations. Uh, we, are, we store everything as Avro, which has a small set of built-in types, but uh, we want to sort of extend the type system and improve the, the static type checking that we have. And we do so by mapping, cust using customized mappings to uh, say that, okay, this is not an Avro type, but this is another type, and here's the logic for mapping this to a particular Avro type. So, for example, if we have JSON, we say that, okay, in Avro, store it as a string, but then the code is generated to sort of serialize and deserialize, so we never see the string. We only see the, the, the J object in this case, uh, or the local data, or, or whatever it is. So this improves our static type checking, which enables us to move faster and change uh, things quicker so that, we, uh, uh, so that we can be more data agile. So, one thing I mentioned when showing this slide was that if you add something here, it should quickly end up here without you having to change all of the boilerplate code, and we haven't shown that yet. Um, this is something in dynamically typed environments, if you have like SQL or, or Pandas, this is something that's fairly easy to do. You can just say, add a field that's sort of derived from these fields, and then it just sort of propagates along easily. If we're in Scala land where everything is statically typed and we want the TP because that's a safety thing that enables us to move fast, then we have to copy, if we want to go from this person to this better person, we, want, we need to sort of copy things and add a lot of code boilerplate. There's a library that solves that, which is kind of neat, uh, because it, through macro generation, says that we can have this person here, and we want to transform that into this better enriched person. Uh, and by default, it will copy all of the fields from the old one. And then we can generate some. And now we have a more expressive language than, than if you use, uh, for example, SQL, uh, so that we can have um, more complex logic in here. And if we forget some field, we get a compilation error. So this is statically typed. Faster feedback cycles, more agile. And this is what it looks in, in some uh, real code, how, how, sort of how it typically looks uh, when we use it. Um, there's a, we sort of leverage a lot from the type system in Scala here, and this is one example where if this is how you, do, how you write code that accepts optional values, then you need to go through this for loop expression so that you can cater for the values might, that might be null. Um, whereas, uh, if you do this a lot, you get tired of it. So you can teach Scala and say, oh, by the way, I know, that, I know how to divide two options. Here's how you do it. And then you can use the, the ordinary syntax, which is what you would have if you were using, for example, pandas. Except that, again, this is type safe. So if you have uh, things that are, uh, that, are, uh, that aren't matching, you will actually get a compile time error. So, uh, doing quite okay. I think I will take the last few slides as well. Uh, we also use this uh, for privacy protection. So we have a way of, of uh, uh, doing privacy protection by separating the personal data that comes in into a sort of uh, separate part and not storing that in the cold store where it's completely mutable. And then we use something called the, the lost key pattern, uh, where we encrypt all of the personal data with a key, and then when, when people want to be deleted, we throw away the key, but, uh, but keep all of the data so that we don't have to go in through the, into the lake and delete all of, the, all of the personal data, which is quite troublesome. This means that we need a whole bunch, a little an entourage of jobs and uh, case classes to so around for each schema class. So we have this uh, variant of the uh, tool built with Scala Meta called shield formation, 
uh, that generates all of these, uh, the anonymous version of the class, the, uh, the encrypted version of the class, and the clear case version, uh, or the clear version of the class, and then jobs to sort of process and move in between them uh, so that as a user, you don't need to keep all of this boilerplate in sync, but you can use the generated code. This is how it looks in a, a, in a workflow uh, setting. I'll, I think I'll skip this, sorry. So with all of these hoops and tricks and, and, and code generation and so forth, we have managed to get the agility that you would otherwise have with schema read solutions, but keeping schema right, keeping everything uh, statically typed and, and closely generated and so forth, which enables us to move faster because we have now shifted errors from production to compile time. All right, um, uh, reaching the end here. Uh, I found that the agility, the speed of agility is absolutely essential in order to succeed things. If you want to see what happened later, and uh, with a focus on agility, Josh Baer, uh, head of the, the machine learning platform at Spotify, has this excellent presentation where he talks a lot about feedback loops and the speed of evaluating things uh, as a sort of a continuation of, of the work that we did a long time ago. Uh, I interviewed some people uh, for a client, and I, one of them, I asked these questions. I, how, how long does it take in your current environment uh, to, from an idea to production? And he said, uh, six to 12 weeks. OK, well, what about if you would do it in a day? Some people can do that. And he said, if management asked me, I, I would push back on unrealistic requirements. So most companies are here. They don't even believe that you can move uh, two orders of magnitude faster. You don't want to be there, and you don't want to be there and not knowing that you're there. Solve things with code. Continuously improve all the time the speed, and if your tools prevent you from this, uh, question them and use some other tools. Thank you. So time for questions. First of all, thanks for a great presentation, Mickey Bro. Thanks a lot. Uh, you mentioned the pipeline where you create a capture all data set versions, and with each change, you save it a, as a different version. Is it correct? How is this going with the cost? I mean, uh, if you're using cloud or some cloud database, yeah, yeah. probably it will explode, of course, and your manager will not like you because of that. So how do you overcome and reconcile that? Yeah, uh, are you referring to the code where, where I said I... Uh, Data sets, yeah, so um, the, there is different version or the different dimensions here. One is the time dimension, and, we, and, and, and everybody is affected by the time dimension. Each hour, new data comes along. But then we often increase the, change the code in some incompatible way, and then we bump versions, and then we regenerate things downstream. And that creates a lot of storage, yes. We don't delete that right away in the way that we used to do. Instead, we keep a bunch of versions, and then we eventually garbage collect things. Yeah, yeah, something like that, which, which saves the operational costs for, for us, for the, or the, the operational time that we put down. Are there any more questions? No? OK. Oh, one more. <laughs> um. Hi. So, so I'm kind of in this enterprise problematic zone where um, innovative data engineering teams are sort of colliding into this corporate wall. Um, maybe this is not so much of the topic, but would you have any recommendation? How can you at least prove that it's not complete crap shot that you're doing here and still sort of uh, maybe convince the C-level who do doesn't believe in anything, goes waterfall 100%? Yeah. Because this is really, kind of, I, I see some similarities that I live through right now. Yeah. So. Uh, the, I mean, this is the story of my last 10 years in trying to, to take people from, from the, or the companies from the lower end and, and sort of dragging them in, in, into the new world. Uh, and you see some of my sort of storytelling here, right? The, uh, I mean, the, the, the Spotify Discover Weekly example is the best I, example I'm have for positive storytelling. Look what kind of innovation you can do if you, if you work differently. 
uh, I'm begging for the Spotify people to, to come up, to share a bunch of stories because I know there are, I know a bunch of other really good stories in there, uh, but they aren't shared in, by them in the same way, and that's not my story to tell, it's theirs. Uh, and uh, then I have a bunch of sort of negative stories as well. Uh, look, because you cannot, don't have data democratization and data engineering, this is what happens in your product. I don't have them in this presentation, but if you look in my other presentations there, are, I've written two blog posts. Uh, and one is you can find easily on LinkedIn. It's about, uh, we used to have a Volvo, and that is a, if you look at it from a data engineering perspective, it's a pile of missed opportunities where if teams could share data, the experience, product experience would be so much better. I have an older similar blog post that I believe is linked from that Volvo blog post about IKEA, where they, their shopping experience, you know, ship, just like Volvo, ship their org chart and you can see how you moved between the teams that don't share data between each other because you have to log in again and type your address in again and it doesn't know where to ship things and, uh, and so forth. Uh, so I try, to, I try to sort of share stories with moderate success, I would say. This is really difficult. We can do one more if anyone has any question. Nope, then we go to break. Thank you so much for your presentation.